uh, all the dust that distress I am of also is uh, walking back on debt terms. It's warning of unrest. The International Monetary Fund has alluded to its stringent bailout conditions that require government to cut subsidies and raise new taxes seen as punitive. They already had pressed Kenyans. It seems we'll need to maybe poke some more holes, notches in our belts to tighten them. We're always waiting for the other shoe to drop as far as taxes are concerned. And looking at what the experts are warning, maybe we need to brace up for more hard times ahead. And is the economy tittering on the age of collapse as far as debt repayment is concerned? Even the $941 million that uh, was loaned to us just recently by IMF, isn't that sufficient enough to at least stabilize us and make us uh, walk on the correct path of recovery as far as physical consolidation is concerned. Right, we'll continue the conversation apace during this morning by Okongo Morgani, who is the senior counsel, also the senator of Nyamira. Also we have with us Dr. Tere Molo, who is the senior counsel, and also the senator, uh, the MM MP of uh, Rarieda. We are joined by also member of parliament for Kamukunji, Yusuf Hassan. Thank you. Let's just hear from uh, senior counsel Okongo Morgani. Your reaction, first of all, you can begin maybe from Friday or you can pick up from uh, where we are at with this uh, no, no, no. <laughs> current state of affairs. Uh, as far yeah, as yeah, I mean, um, that was a good decision. It was a good uh, decision. By the, the judiciary. And uh, as Otienda Mola has indicated, we argued that matter with him yes. in, in the High Court. And uh, the High Court, in a very well-reasoned judgment, uh, declared the housing levy unconstitutional. You know, because what the government was uh, trying to do is uh, to introduce that taxation through an amendment of the Employment Act, which, you know, on, on the face of it, was uh, very, very unconstitutional. So I think that that was commendable. The way I was looking at it, it was a, a make or break for, for the judiciary, because they have really been under intense pressure and vilification uh, from the uh, Uda Side so that they can stand up and uh, you know pronounce the law and, and they refuse to give a stay on a matter that uh, the High Court has declared unconstitutional mm -hmm. is a reflection of uh, how independent the institution called judiciary is and how useful it can be to executive overreach in this country. Any other, any other judgment I think could have sent signals that. Uh, after the capture of parliament, the executive had uh, also succeeded in capturing the judiciary. Remember, Dibala had written an article, I think some time early in the year, where he said uh, in these fights between the executive and the judiciary, when you're on the wrong side of the law as executive, the judiciary will always have the, 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 the final laugh. And uh, I want to appeal to the old administration to allow the judiciary to do its work. And uh, if you, you look at uh, what's happening globally, it's not only the judiciary in Kenya that is declaring unconstitutional or illegal or null and void uh, legislations that are being pushed through by uh, the government. You saw what happened in uh, Israel, the Supreme Court of Israel. I saw on Thursday, last week, the 25th, in France, the the Constitutional Council, you know, that's the, the equivalent of the High Court, declared unconstitutional 32 amendments to the immigration law out of the proposed 86 amendments. And uh, you have not had people raising eyebrows in, in France. The government has accepted the decision of the Constitutional Court and uh, it, it's moving on. But what even preceded that decision is the way the government of France respected the rights of citizens. More than 75,000 uh, French people were in the streets protesting against that legislation. In Kenya, if you even just issue a notice that uh, you want to invoke our constitutional rights of uh, picketing, the government will respond with uh, tear gas. The government will respond by unleashing uh, unreasonable force uh, from the security forces against a citizen. So allow Kenya to remain what it is, a democratic uh, country, 
our president must come to, to term that we have three arms of government. You know, we have the executive, we have parliament, we have judiciary. The way uh, our president wants to operate Ruto is, is, is to rewrite, rewrite our constitution and tell us that there is only one arm, the executive. Once they propose something, the legislature should accept it and the judiciary should live with it even if it's unconstitutional. That's not the way we build uh, a democracy. That is actually inviting anarchy. You know, because when you tell us that we cannot go to uh, court to question some of the unconstitutional uh, decisions of, of the executive, you are telling us that we resort to the law of the jungle, where we, 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 we box and fight each other. And as much more has said, I think the ball now again shifts to parliament, because uh, the executive still uh, wants to push through uh, this housing, uh, housing uh, tax thing. They have uh, proposed a law that is, uh, I think, on the committee stage. We, we now must make an appeal to <coughs> our MPs, you know, to read what happens in other jurisdictions. It's, it's not illegal, it's not unlawful to question a proposed legislation by the executive. It has been done and, and we can do it. We must be sensitive that uh, at times you can have a president who thinks he's an institution to himself. You know, just like what uh, Thatcher, uh, Margaret Thatcher did in, in Britain, where you think you are all knowing, you are motivated by exercise of raw power, you want to push anything and everything down the throat of uh, citizens without looking at the, you know, unconstitutionality of what you are doing and even the effects of what you are doing on, on the economy, uh, Debal. So our members of parliament who are currently, especially National Assembly, uh, undertaking public uh, participation on the proposed housing uh, levy, they should proceed uh, cautiously, they should read uh, the High Court uh, decision, they should also take into account the fact that uh, housing is a devolved function, so the county should be really central. And also the concerns that have been raised by Kenyans, that you can't force Kenyans who reside in the rural areas to buy houses when they are comfortable residing in, in the rural areas. I was in Yamira last week, <laughs> and you know, somebody showed up in, in a funeral and said, Senator, if you go to Nairobi, tell President Ruto, if he wants to insist on this uh, housing levy, then he should deduct money from all Kenyans and then share it back to us uh, counties. Then that money comes to us as counties will build houses for the poor ourselves because we know where the poor people in the, in the villages. So this thing is extremely, uh, you know, problematic. It is a, a matter that is very, very unpopular among Kenyans. It was initially marketed as, as an initiative by the old administration to build uh, houses for the poor. Then it's changed. We were told it would be a saving scheme. Uh, that again was removed. We were told now it is a scheme to get jobs for uh, the, the young people. And everything you see is just people of vested interest mm -hmm. who want to do Thank you. business and benefit from it. The, the beneficiary, I can tell you, the bar, is not the common one inch there. It's, it's some mandarins in government who want to benefit from this uh, scheme. So I hope, Mushimiwa uh, Hassan, when you go back to parliament, you will uh, be sensitive to the concerns that Kenyans have raised. Turning to the economy, um, Dibal, every, every move that the uh, administration has made is coming back to bite them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah just, just, we, stay, just uh, stay on a bit uh, yeah. with that. I'll, I'll, I'll come to you uh, on the economy. Because I wanted to just raise the issue of the legislation process and the quality of uh, le legislating process in our, in our country, in our, in our parliament. Lately, there has been questions around it. If this also finance act, which was a bill then, was tucked in the ominous, was it a, a, a standalone or was it part of the ominous bill with the statutory amendment bill of 2023? Do you have sufficient time to actually interrogate some of these bills? Because it seems when there is any sensitive bill that maybe will need interrogation and time to be scrutinized by members of parliament, it is always tucked in the ominous bill. 
so that you don't have sufficient time. Uh, you, you're staying on in Parliament for late into the night. You are actually, you know, uh, strained at the end of the day in terms of your output. Uh, you can't think enough, so it will just pass so easily. Do we need to go back and try and see uh, how the, the ominous bill can be treated? Well, um, I agree with the Honorable Omoga and Honorable Yusuf in terms of the role of parliament and to the extent to which parliament, especially the National Assembly where I belong, is to blame. Uh, I was hoping Honorable Yusuf would go ahead and own up <laughs> to that mistake uh, because I am happy to own up as a member of the National Assembly. But the problem why we have failed resides in Kenya Kwanzaa, to which Honorable Yusuf now belongs. Oh, that's and absolutely <laughs> not the case. <laughs> that is not true. And and we will come back to that. We will come back to that. At all material time, <laughs> my understanding, <laughs> let, let me just say my understanding. No, no, then you, you have deny. to withdraw that statement. <laughs> because I am a member of a political party of which you know which it is. Uh, it's completely untrue. It's a lie. <laughs> and I told you I was going to challenge you on that. <laughs> well, you know, the ball. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I let, want let, you to I, I sympathize that. with Honorable no, no, Yusuf no, no. and with not, yourself. No, no, I'll it explain. Is, it I'll is explain. not true. No, no, I'll explain. Can you look at my voting pattern in, in the National Assembly and show me where that has happened? You uh, know, uh, uh, <clears throat> what is interesting. Uda is, is being is, is, is how quickly <laughs> everyone is running away from Kenya, Kwanzaa, and Uda. You know, uh, everywhere you go, everyone says, no, 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 I'm not in Uda, I'm not in Kenya, Kwanzaa, even those who have chosen to associate politically with it. Uh, and I think I sympathize with you, because increasingly when we come for these shows, I think it takes courage to get anyone defending <laughs> Uda or Kenya, Kwanzaa. Maybe we should just uh, stop these shows, because I'm, I'm sympathizing with, the, with, the, with this regime in terms of uh, being disowned. Now, um, Honorable Yusuf, my understanding, at all material time, uh, you as an elected member and the political party were always in Azimio, having duly signed the Azimio, Azimio coalition agreement. To my knowledge, to date, there has not been any lawful or legal process of withdrawal from Azimio. What has happened is not a de jure withdrawal, but a de facto withdrawal. The, the political outfit that you belong have chosen to declare publicly that they are now with the Kenya Kwanzaa regime and in fact to execute all actions that demonstrate that including contributions in the National Assembly and the Senate and voting. Now you can speak to that later. To that extent, mm -hmm. um, it is my understanding that you are neck deep in, that <laughs> in, in the government side, contrary to law. But if you have since come back home, I think you are highly welcome. <laughs> because then you will help us tell these people what ought to be said. I didn't, number know, two. I didn't know we had come here to address <laughs> you. No, 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 no. Number two. No, no. I, I am happy with I'll, that. I'll give, you, I'll give you a chance to, no, to, to, to get a rejoinder. No, no, no. Yes. Number two. Mm. I am, thought you I'm we just, had come to debate I'm, our national issues here. No, no, no. And it, am, seems, it seems that you do not have a good argument. You are personally focusing on the individual who is here. No, no, no. Yes. I am actually agreeing with you because you've said, you've started by saying parliament is to blame. Parliament is a collectivity of individual MPs. And therefore, for you to blame parliament or the National Assembly, you must address the conduct of the individuals who comprise it. I am the first to admit that we as the National Assembly, particularly, but parliament generally, have failed Kenyans. For us to address it, we must go into the, de the, the depth of why have we failed. One of the reasons we have failed is that elected members have refused to respect their lands. If you are elected on the side of the minority, stick to the minority. Do not be wooed to join the majority. Because what has happened is that a lot of elected members who ought to be in the minority, what people generally call the opposition, have been wooed to join mm -hmm. the government side mm -hmm. and they have created some temporary super majority. And the result is that parliament and especially the National Assembly cannot critically examine what needs to be examined. Two, why it has failed is that in the process of doing that, 
it has compromised the leadership of parliament. And parliament is no longer a house of debate, a house of examination of the legality and propriety of laws and policies. It has become a rubber stamp. Mm -hmm. We have become robotic to the wishes of the executive. Mm -hmm. Now, all the things that have been said of, if you look at the court cases, if you look at the social health insurance fund, if you look at the, you know, the G2G deal, if, uh, which has not come to court yet, if you look at the affordable housing or the IT issue, you will find that either all these things were said, like when it comes to affordable housing, mm -hmm. or in the case of Haiti, we were denied the opportunity to say the very things that the court is now saying. And I've, I explained last week how the Haiti debate went. Honorable Yusuf was only one of six MPs who contributed. And Honorable Yusuf supported the idea of deployment. Those of us who wanted to oppose were never given a chance. And I was right in front of one of Yusuf. He will see and he will confirm to you that I was so, I was so uh, dejected that all the notes had prepared and all, I just told them and left them there because now they're of no use and I walked out. And that is the second problem in Parliament. It's not just the voting. It is the refusal to give people of contrary opinion the opportunity to voice their view. So that if you look at the Hansard, for example, in respect of Haiti deployment, you could be tempted to say that how come these members of parliament could not debate and discuss these very obvious issues that the court is now saying. But we could not because there was no opportunity. It is choreographed first. It is brought, usually it starts with the, what we call the House Business Committee. Mm -hmm. You know, something is sprung which you did not know. At the beginning of the week, a big issue like the Haiti thing, you, you didn't know that it would come. You suddenly just see it in the order paper. It, you see it in the order paper and it's being fast tracked within one day. So that from the introduction to the conclusion, it is well within a day. So if you are, for example, in Mombasa or Kisumu, you don't have that opportunity. But even when you rush to parliament, then <laughs> there's a very strategic way of trying to understand, and of course they know in advance, who, will, who is likely to support, who is likely not to support. You put your card there. The only person who knows you want to speak is the speaker and yourself. Mm. You just don't get that opportunity. Mm. The, you, the alternative you're left with is to become a mad person to stand and sh shouting in parliament, which is unparliamentary. Mm -hmm. So that opportunity is also not there. So we have a big problem in parliament in terms of processing, uh, you know, policies, in terms of people crossing over, in terms of leadership. We must be honest, and I agree with uh, Senator Mugene. You know, if you think you know everything, and you think you can ra ride roughshod over everyone, including parliament, including the judiciary, including everyone, then you are shuttling in the wrong direction. We need to recalibrate. Mm -hmm. uh, William Ruto and this regime need to just pull back and recalibrate. Look at what's happening in terms of these debt issues and the IMF. Now, first, it is very interesting because at all material time, uh, we knew and it, we have been made to understand that this regime and William Ruto particularly is like the blue-eyed boy of the Britain World's institutions, you know, and a few uh, of what I would call our, you know, foreign friends, who have been, who are very instrumental in making sure that uh, William Ruto won, or was declared to have won, and was quickly sworn in. And they have essentially taken over economic decision making of this country, and I said this in Parliament. The result is that we are going back to where we were in terms of the structural adjustment programs where the focus is not on what's good for the ordinary Kenyan, mm -hmm. but it's what's good in the eyes of the national geo, uh, international geopolitics. It took not just this country, but many other countries, especially in what we call the global south, courage to refuse and resist the structural adjustment program. And that's when we came back on track in terms of the good of the citizens. It must take us that. When you read, uh, you know, like this article, where the IMF is saying, you know, it's opposed subsidies in terms of fuel, subsidies in terms of food, but it's talking about repayment of debts and all that. In whose interest are we working? 
The good thing with it, though, is that uh, we and Inazimio were always calling for, you know, Mandamano. But I'm happy now IMF itself is calling for money. <laughs> <laughs> we, we should be happy to oblige. You know? <laughs> but that is not really <laughs> the, the, the position with the address that they're calling. Yeah? But it's, it's not their I want to agree with Honorable Yusuf on, on many scores. For example, we are not addressing the economic uh, issues the way we ought to address them. And he cited the example of wanton expenditure, if, including in terms of travel. It is true. How do you have a situation where you are in dire economy and then for the first time, I think in the last 20 years, the travel expenditure of the president alone, before you come to the deputy and the ministers, is like 20 times of the president alone and the interim. You have travels like now you just showed uh, you know, that meeting in, uh, in Italy. Mm -hmm. If you look at that picture, the only other president I saw there from Africa was Mnanagwa of Zimbabwe. I didn't see any other. We can still look at it. I think there were 20 uh, head of states. Uh, yeah. uh, from the Africa. Of the climate. Uh, you know, from Africa. I only saw the Mnanagwa from Zimbabwe, the chair of the African Union, you know, like that, like that. Is it necessary? You know, our president spends more time in foreign capitals than in this country. And the ministers have taken queue and everyone else. And that also creeps back to parliament. Part of the reason why some members of parliament cross over is because then you get uh, favors, like you're given opportunity by the speakers to have international travels and to get some of those goodies. Look, look at this. Secondly, when you are digging, when you're in a hole, you don't keep digging. Is it time to focus on capital investment? Is it time to have this all scheme, for example, of the so-called affordable housing scheme? People are already overtaxed. Housing mm -hmm. is not the most critical thing. Yes. Why insist on it, for, for God's sake? Why insist on it and people just want to survive? Mm -hmm. In this economy, you will remember that in two or three, yeah, when uh, Kibaki came in, there was the focus to rebuilding the economy. And what he did was essentially to have a bipartisan approach to the economic uh, matter, to bring in people, Kenyans who everyone agreed that would be helpful, irrespective of their political divide. You know, uh, I think there were about nine or so of them, you know, and they were tasked to just rebuild this economy. And they did not come in as politicians. This regime is trying to make politicians resolve economic crisis, politicians who campaigned for them. Number three, is the mentality, you know, what you have, the, the shareholder mentality. The regime believes that even problems that affect all Kenyans can only be resolved by those who are politically affiliated to them, so that there's no consultation. I have seen that, um, you know, there's this call on, on the standard, you know, the, the headline, and part of the suggestion, and I agree with them, is that there is need to involve more than just the executive should involve parliament, you should involve civil society, you should involve other people to say, this is the problem. Thank you. How can we resolve it? But instead, what we are seeing is something that is just annoying. Uh, something where you are saying there's no money. But when this regime comes to say a fundraiser, the amount of money they produce is immoral. Where do get, they get that money? Yes. When you see, and I've just seen here, my friend and uh, who is my good friend, Dindi Nyoro, is, uh, you know, uh, apparently disposing 36% take yeah, in, in the business KPLC. Mm -hmm. Where did Dindi Nyoro get money to get 36% <laughs> in KPLC? And just in 2013, he was just the chairman of Kiharu, CDF. You know, everything speaks to a blatant disregard of but the economy. He's, he's not here to defend himself. Uh, let's hear from uh, Mwishimo. First, we, want, we wanted to get a rejoinder that I didn't, I didn't give you a sporting chance yeah. to. Yeah. Well, thank Ochina you. Molo. Well, first of all, I am really disappointed with my uh, learned friend mm -hmm. in the sense that he knows uh, the political realities of um, uh, the Kenyan opposition, Azimio in particular, that there are uh, disagreements, that there are differences of opinion, uh, which in, to a certain extent is a, 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 a democratic uh, process and a de democratic right. Uh, that um, to argue that in fact uh, my views 
uh, determined by uh, the affiliations or the associations that I have uh, is also to <laughs> somehow uh, um, radical or uh, disregard uh, my own independent thinking. I have been in Parliament for four terms. I'm elected uh, on my own right as a member of Parliament and I represent the people of Kamkunji very well. In the last election, uh, we had differences after the election, like what happens every time when there's an election. If you fail to win, there's always a fallout. And Azimio has, uh, has, has had that fallout. And um, a significant number of Jubilee members uh, have uh, detached themselves uh, from belonging to Azimio. They want to have an independent, uh, they want to stand up as an independent uh, uh, opposition uh, party in parliament not associated with either Azimio or Kenya Kwanza, but uh, making decisions based on its own interest as a party uh, on the daily uh, activities of, uh, uh, of our country. So to argue uh, because one has voted or has sided with one particular political party that one doesn't have the right to do so mm -hmm. uh, is not right. We live in a democracy. And I just want to remind him also of the last uh, parliament where he was in. His own political party, which was the opposition, I was in government at that time, mm -hmm. sided with the government and voted with the government every day. He knows that. Uh, so what right did ODM have in, uh, uh, in the last election uh, to cease to become an opposition party and be part of the ruling party's uh, uh, voting machine uh, that he's denying to the Jubilee party today decisions, independent decisions to decide where they want to be. <coughs> So let me put that to rest. The second point is, of course, we don't disagree on the direction, ec the economic problems of our country. Mm -hmm. we, we think that um, economically there are very serious issues in our country that need to be addressed. And I agree also that, in fact, maybe the government needs to call for a national uh, economic uh, summit uh, in order for us to be able to discuss as Kenyans even outside parliament and outside the political parties, to discuss uh, uh, the Kenya we want and what is wrong with Kenya and what we can do economically to move forward. It's not just uh, something uh, which is the, um, uh, the, the absolute monopoly of the, um, uh, of the government of the day and the president and the executive. On two issues, uh, the housing levy, I support the housing levy, and I disagree with some of the, uh, my colleagues here who say that housing is not a priority, is not urgent. For me, coming from an urban neighborhood like uh, uh, Nairobi, coming from Kamkunji, which has got a very large informal settlement, housing is very urgent and important, and housing is a right. There are thousands of my constituencies who live in slum, uh, deploring squalid conditions. You know, they have a right to, to, to have decent housing, uh, decent, decent livelihood and a, a clean, uh, healthy environment. And the, the housing levy provides an opportunity for that process to be accelerated so that they can have uh, a decent um, uh, and, uh, and, and a place in our society. It's people, people who have houses and who have uh, mortgages and who have built houses uh, who may say that housing is not a priority. Housing is absolute priority for me in my constituency and in Nairobi as a, as a member of parliament for Nairobi. The second one is Haiti, of which Honorable Atien uh, knows that I supported it. I supported the Haiti uh, uh, issue because it involves our police force and, and there was an argument that the police force cannot be deployed. But there is a precedent. There is a precedent I worked in the United Nations system for many years. I found Ke Kenyan police officers uh, in Timor. Uh, I've seen them in Kosovo. They have been uh, deployed to Liberia and uh, Sierra Leone. Uh, in fact, our deputy is Inspector General of Police, Nur Gabo, was um, in charge of the UN police. Kenya was contributing so much that, in fact, the, uh, they were acknowledged by having a senior member of our police force uh, to head that particular department. So there is a precedent. Maybe uh, it is important for, uh, uh, for us to look at how we have done, but we have done it in the past and we have done it very successful. The issue of Haiti 
has been politicized because of the history of Haiti. And I, coming, uh, coming from the left, um, Haiti is a, has had this glorious revolution um, 220 years ago. It became the first black uh, nation in the world, the first black republic in the nation. It was the first slave rebellion, successful slave rebellion. And as a country, it, we've always had a very strong uh, connections as Africans mm -hmm. uh, and people of African descent with Haiti because of its historical role. Mm -hmm. And over the years, though, Haiti has declined to the point why today there's hardly uh, any state system uh, to talk of. And I think it is important for Africa, uh, for Kenya, and other uh, like-minded countries to contribute to the stabilization uh, of, uh, of Haiti as a, as a country. Uh, it, we have an obligation as Africans. And I absolutely see no problem whatsoever for Kenya as an independent member, a member of the United Nations, to make a contribution that would help uh, make a difference in the case of Haiti. Because at the moment, Haiti is in a state of chaos and mayhem. Mm -hmm. uh, it is hell on earth. Uh, and um, we have um, the responsibility to be able to play our part as a country. Uh, and um, uh, we need to review mm -hmm. uh, this particular situation because it is Haiti today. But tomorrow, what would happen if Kenya is required to contribute to a similar problem in our region, uh, in our continent? Are we going, are our hands going to be tied to the point where we're, we will not be able to contribute to peacekeeping efforts or to uh, policing efforts uh, in, in conflict-torn countries of our, of our region? We have even our police officers in uh, DRC and in uh, Somalia training in the, in the training right. areas. But the question that uh, mm. you, you raise the issue of precedence. So if we the had court deployed... Disconceded, <clears throat> completely disregarded the, the precedent that in fact we have so if, 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 if it was unlawful precedent, do, do you think that then we should be steamrolling that unlawfulness? No, no, but uh, the, question, the question is that uh, in some areas of um, deployment, military deployment, is that this is the main responsibility of, uh, uh, of the executive supported by uh, parliament. If there was war today, uh, would the president be... Uh, not allowed to deploy our forces but, to defense our, our national security. But will, will be the military or will be the police? No, no, even if the police, the police would be required in certain situations. Police is, a, um, is just another uh, uh, uniform service in our country. It may have a different uh, constitutional uh, responsibility. It's a constitutional uh, 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 responsibility is defined in the constitution. But I'm saying that there has been a precedent for the last 60 years. So the Kenya president, the president now sending the police uh, to Haiti is, uh, is an abrogation of the constitution? I think um, that has to be looked at. I, don't I think this is it. what uh, senior council is raising, yeah. that this is an abrogation but of the we constitution. Have we have deployed for the last 60 years. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. It's, <laughs> it's, it's been unlawful in the, for the last, in the last 60 years. No, but even in the last 10 years, <laughs> even recently, uh, to, to Somalia and DRC, we have deployed uh, police units. Uh, and South Sudan. I have not heard you chiming in on the issue that was raised also on the, the, the nature of debates that we have in the National Assembly. That I, I, and I, the legislations that seems just to slip through no, that no, are very I, questionable I, and then they go to the courts and then it will become... So we're actually in a vicious cycle. No, no, but there's two things here. One is the quality of bills that are brought to Parliament. The quality of you bills. You know, the bills are brought by government. We, we as members of Parliament interrogate them. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, having been in the, in the last four parliaments, yes. is that I fully agree with, uh, uh, with, with uh, the member of parliament for Rarieda, mm -hmm. that in fact the space for discussions, the st space for interrogation of bills uh, and debate uh, has, has narrowed or declined. Some people argue that because we have too many members of parliament now than in the past, uh, but I absolutely agree with him. In fact, if you look at the Hansard, I spoke more times in the 10th or the 11th or the, uh, the 12th parliament than I have an opportunity to speak. And there isn't a day I come to parliament uh, to discuss an issue with notes mm -hmm. uh, that um, I, I may not have the chance to speak mm -hmm. for various reasons or not. So it is true that in fact the, the level of debate... Uh, so is it, is it being stifled? 
by, I, I by the system in the house? I, I wouldn't know that. I, I wouldn't uh, uh, be able to say that because I do not know, do not know in the... But you've expressed the desire that you wanted to, act, to participate in the debates, but yes, you've not yes. been given a sporting chance. Yes, but there are several reasons for that because there, there are many people who also want to speak on the subject and there are only so many, so, so, so few that uh, the speaker can give uh, an opportunity to speak and the speaker has the prerogative. I don't belong to the leadership of the, the, uh, the parliament, although I'm one of the most uh, uh, senior and long-serving. So uh, the uh, member of parliament knows more about that than me because he serves, he's even our legal representative, uh, parliamentary legal representative. Uh, but I, I think it is, it is because of the numbers, I think because of the pressure and so on, but the qu quality of debate, the space for debate, has narrowed down in this particular parliament. But it's never There's been no question about it. But it's never been a frustration with previous uh, uh, national assemblies. Uh, no, no, we have the same numbers. There and is always. There we, is we always have, uh, I, this I, has I, been a constant concern. Of I would say the last uh, oh. parliament was uh, completely perfect. We had the same problems, but I think over time that space has been narrowing, and it has become very difficult to get time to interrogate and have a debate and correct uh, some of the mistakes that might uh, uh, appear uh, in some of the bills. Mm -hmm. All right, so some of these bills they, they emanate from the National Assembly, they come to the Senate, and there's a poor quality of legislation. So how then do you process? No, no, the there's, uh, there's always, uh, especially from uh, this uh, Kenya Kwanzaa administration, there's always a scheme to ex exclude the Senate from uh, getting involved in some of these, uh, you know, uh, debating some of these bills because you know the problem we have uh, Dibal, if, if you read personality traits of, of leaders you you have a president uh, whom we respect is our president William Ruto who has this belief that once it comes to an idea then the passage in parliament and execution is for himself he does not understand that uh, we are operating in, in an environment where the executive should propose legislations and then they move to parliament and parliament should get a free hand uh, to debate. You know, you'll find if, if a bill is proposed by the executive, it will be followed by a communique to maybe the leadership in the parliament that the president needs to launch this law on this and this de certain dates. So already you are uh, putting parliament into a fix. You want parliament, the speaker is already under pressure to ensure that that bill is enacted maybe within a period of seven days. You, you read the public advertisements on public participation. <laughs> You'll see bills that are being subjected to three days of public participation. Yet, you know, we have all these 47 uh, counties. The courts have ruled not once, many times, that uh, public participation should be really all-inclusive. You know, it, it should not be a thing of forwarding and clearing. You just say, we send this to the public, we got views, and that is it. So, I want to fully agree with uh, my friend, uh, Honorable Tende Amol, that we have a big problem in the parliament, or now we pass our legislations. Just to demonstrate how important uh, this role of parliament is, just go to the US, look at how Congress processes bills. One. This is what you call the party caucus. You know, if, if you propose a bill from, even if it's from uh, the Kwanzaa government, and it comes to the floor, there should first be a caucus of the parliamentarians constituting the Kenya Kwanzaa side in, in parliament, where I am sure Mwishmiya Yusuf will be glad to sit. He will not sit with the Azimio. He will sit with Kenya Kwanzaa. Then there should be a debate there. The floor, in, in the US, the person they call floor manager will moderate debates there. And if members have an issue, it's not uh, the executive to tell them oh, we want this law within this uh, timeline. You give members of uh, Congress, in this case should be members of parliament, adequate time to debate their bills, make proposals on the floor, then there is reasoning. Then after you finish with the issue of caucus, there is what we call uh, a cooperative approach in, in passing legislation. The majority side will reach out to the minority side and say, look, there's this bill that we are proposing. What is the view of the minority side? And then the minority side will also have a caucus of the minority side. We raise issues and then we retreat now to say, how do we process these bills going forward? 
That's what Utenda Molo was telling you, that the approach by the UDA administration is to push through everything down the throat of Kenyans. They don't want to listen to any alternative uh, view. If the government was to uh, step down and accept that when you have a country, you, are, you have a country of 50 million Kenyans, we have been elected from different coalitions. When we come to uh, parliament, we owe all Kenyans to pass uh, laws that are, make sense, that are constitutional, that don't put a lot of burden on Kenyans. That way, Debal, you will have a parliament that is more responsive to the people that we represent. But if we continue with this idea of uh, push through the, the, the bill to parliament, make it a clearing and forwarding, when there is heated debate, the speaker tells you, you have three minutes. Now, even if it's you, if we invite you to parliament and we tell you you have three minutes to contribute on a bill, what will you say? You just make an introduction and, and your time lapse, uh, lapses. So let's, let's reflect as an institution called parliament, okay? Let's not have this idea of saying, if you want to pass the housing levy, it must be enacted within one month. What is the hurry? I agree with Moshimiwa that uh, we have a problem with housing. But the approach is, 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 is not to just bring a law and ensure that you pass it within the next seven days. No. Move slowly. We also have proposals. If you want to deal with the issue of housing, you want people from the informal settlements to, to get housing, how has it been done before? The government has uh, always come up with a scheme of building affordable houses for rent. That's where you have Kaloleni as, as an estate. That's where you have Makongeni as an estate. You build those houses and then you make them available for the people that Moshimiwa represents to come and lease those houses. I want to ask Moshimiwa to tell me which Kenyan from the informal settlement is going to buy these uh, affordable houses at 3.1 million shillings. Well, they said 4.2. Or 4.2. Nobody. But depending if you allow the county to build uh, decent houses, you know, they could be single rooms or two uh, double rooms with uh, amenities. You give them water, you give them sewer, and then rent them at affordable rates of, of 3,000. I don't know, Moshimua Yusuf, what, what people pay the county government of Nairobi as rent in, uh, in Makungeni, but I, I believe it's fairly affordable. It, it, it's not more than 1,500. That way, you will uh, have a motivation of people moving from the informal settlement to come and lease those houses that have been built by government at affordable prices. But to cheat Kenyans that they are going to come and buy those houses at 3.1 or 4.2, we are lying to Kenyans. That is not going to happen. This is just a scheme to ensure that... Uh, those who have an interest in doing business with the government will wreak massive profits. And these houses will be bought by Kenyans who are in the Ada, Kada. Let me ask you, Moshimiwa, in Ingara, houses were built by government. Do you have any, anybody you can point I out? I don't know whether this has become a debate <laughs> between me and you. No, no. you know, you, you, you said you are representing the people from assistant. the informal. Dibal, I can answer you. If you go to Ingara today, the people who have bought those houses are people who are already working in the higher middle class level within the government. Mm. It has not benefited the people Mwishimu is talking about from the informal settlement. Mm -hmm. So we are not providing solutions that is targeting the so-called hustlers or the people in the informal settlement. In fact, what we are doing is giving an opportunity to the upper middle class to increase their houses, uh, the, the, the rental portfolio that they already have. So you are not giving solutions. Uh, to Kenyans. On the issue of Haiti, I think what the High Court has, has, has told the government, and if, if I was uh, the, the Attorney General of the government, I'll tell them, the court is giving you an easy way out. The court is telling you, if you read our constitution and our laws, there is, uh, the law does not give power to the government to deploy our police to Haiti. That is, that's the law. Accept it, sit back, reflect, and look for an alternative. Two, the court is telling you, you cannot deploy our armed forces to Ahiti without the approval of parliament. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. They are, the, the courts are just restating 
what is in the statutes. And the government should own up and, and do the right thing. Haiti is a dangerous country to begin with. As we speak, Haiti does not even have a president. I don't know that you, yes, yeah. you are aware. Yes, there is no president in Haiti. <laughs> the environment is chaotic, to say the least. Extremely chaotic. So even before you send our sons and daughters to Haiti, you should also sit back as a president and say, is that place conducive for our soldiers or our police officers to be deployed to? Why are other countries shying away from deploying to Haiti? It's because you are, t you are sending people to, to right. their grave. To, to, to the right. grave. Let's so hear from a... Addressed, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so on Haiti, you should give me an uh, opportunity to defend <laughs> Let, myself. No, no. Uh, just, uh, you just let's go to the question. The question actually against me, and I'm not spoken. <laughs> so let me just, uh, very briefly, uh, let me start from the point where Honorable uh, Morgan has left. And I think it relates to the story on page 10 of the standard. You know, this constant attack by my colleagues and those in Kenya Kwanza against the judiciary, that the judiciary is derailing its project. I think it is important to note that in none of the decisions that have been made has the judiciary questioned the policy mm -hmm. because it's not within its process, province. It is within the province of the judiciary to question the legality and constitutionality, and that's all they've done. So instead of attacking the judiciary and instead of attacking those of us who go to court by threatening to behead us and all that, the regime should sit back and ask itself, if we want to do this, how do we do it legally? And I'm happy Honorable Yusuf agrees to that extent. On these twin issues that Honorable Yusuf addressed, housing and Haiti, let us start with the question of Haiti. There's the question of the legality and the question of the necessity. Yeah, I wanted just to, before you go to the legality, so that you can actually point to me the exact uh, place in the Constitution uh, where there's uh, abrogation of acts. No, I'll, I'll explain to you, okay. even without going to the exact, because okay. we agreed on this. All right. The design of our Constitution is simple. It creates the armed forces and the police, and it changes the name from, of the police from a force yeah, to a service for a good reason. The police is not supposed to be a force as it was before 2010. It is a service to the people. That is why even the inspector general of the police can be a civilian, does not have to be a person who is a policeman. That is the whole idea. And the purpose of the police is to maintain peace within the borders of Kenya. The police is not supposed to engage with anything outside of our borders. On the other hand, the armed forces are supposed to protect us from external aggression. And they are not supposed to involve with the runnings of matters within the country. Which is why, if there's to be any deployment, you must involve parliament. And therefore, the issue, and I, gave, I told you how, the issue of trying to invite this by deploying the armed forces within the country like they did in North Rio, and trying to deploy the police outside, like they're trying to do in Haiti, is an, a contravention of the Constitution in terms of design. And I'll, I, I'll point you to the exact uh, specifics. Now, you do not answer that by saying it has been done before, for over 60 years. No. You answer it by saying, is it or is it not true that this is an abrogation of the Constitution? If it is so desirous to deploy people to maintain peace. Why the police? We have main, much fewer policemen in this country than the ratio of people that they need to protect. On the other hand, we have many men in the armed forces who are all in the barracks. Is it more convenient to deploy the police who we need out here? And you know, you open the papers, you see incidents of robbery and all those things that the police should deal with. Why not take the armed forces who are in the barracks? if it's a question of necessity. Two, is it necessary for Kenya to deploy? The argument has always been we were requested. That's a white line. If you look at the sequence of things, we offered to send peacekeepers to Haiti. 
the resolution that came was first not specific to Kenya. It was a general request for members of the UN. But secondly, it came after we had offered. So we actually stood out there and we offered. And why did we offer? It brings me to the third point. It is not in the necess you know, strategic interest or necessity for Kenya to deploy any sort of peace, uh, you know, forces to Haiti. It is in the strategic interest of the United States. But they choose not to deploy anywhere there, anyone there because of the cost of losing a life and the implication is perceived to be less harmful if it's some Kenyans who go there. And that is why you find a very strange situation where our courts have declared the deployment of the police is unlawful. The president says he will appeal. A foreign government says they support the appeal to, by the president. It's very strange. Instead of saying we support the independence of the judiciary in making the decision, in other words, they are trying to influence the appeal. You know, it's outrageous. Let's come to the housing. Again, it's about legality and necessity. Mm -hmm. Now, I will not address the legality because I think it's well covered already. But the question is this, okay? If it is necessary, why not heed? And I was on the floor of parliament, one of Yusuf was there, when I told our colleagues mm -hmm. that, look, for me, I don't think it is necessary. But assuming it is necessary, why not listen to advice in terms of how to effect it? Why not listen when we said, and I said that you cannot just impose it in the finance bill. Why don't you bring legislation, like now they're trying to do, that becomes the foundation? And I told them that, in fact, you might think you're assisting uh, William Ruto achieve this process, but you're actually sabotaging it. So the legality becomes very important. And one of the questions I asked, is it affordable housing or affordable ownership? Because you know, to date, that has not been clear. They say we are constructing houses which you can rent at so much or you can buy at so much. A country has to be clear. If you want to build affordable housing for people who are already uh, lacking money, then you say this house will cost two million shillings. But we want to be able to sell it to Kenyans of Kamukunji at one million shillings. How do you do that? You get whatever sources you can get, whether it's from other taxes, to you know, subsidize the one million. Then it becomes affordable because the cost is lower than the actual cost. You don't tax that Kenyan that gave me 500 by force and I will use that 500 to construct for you a house which then you can buy for me, from me. Actually, they will end up buying it at higher than the amount they contributed. Mm -hmm. So conceptually, they are still confused. But even be beyond that, you know, when you say that there are Kenyans say, and I won't use Kamukunji because Mashimua will take offense in mm -hmm. Kibra, who need to get houses, that is true. But you first must address a very fundamental thing. Why is it that whenever we've tried to build houses for the low-income earners and tried to sell at a certain price, we end up with the middle class occupying it rather than the low-income earners? Mm -hmm. It's because there's a priority gap there. You'd rather stay in a shackle but have food and water than stay comfortably and starve. And that, therefore, that's what we must address uh, you know, much more primarily. So the whole issue is skewed. My last point, Rombo Yusuf, I am not attacking you personally. And I accept your attack on me, though. When you say that how come in the last parliament, our own party and our party leader chose to work with the Jubilee? It is true they did. And that's why if you attack me on that, I will not take offense, unlike you who's taking offense. But then I would be able to point out that although we came into some working arrangement, you know, as the ODM with the Jubilee Party. Whenever I felt that there were things that my own party was doing wrong, I would point them out. And you know that, and you know I suffered for it. Now, in the same vein, you should not take offense when I say you have gone to bed with the older government. How have you gone to bed? On 8th of February last year, the entire team of Jubilee elected members of parliament, with the exception of one, I think it's Solomon Mwenje, went to State House 
And in fact, if you Google, you'll see that their, their statement was, we are back home. The person who sat next to the DP was Honobu Yusuf on 8th of February to date. From that time to date, you have not publicly told Kenyans that you are no longer in that home, that you've come back to your original home. So if I made the mistake of saying that that which looks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quacks like a duck is a duck, surely I cannot be wrong. <laughs> my, last very, my very last point is the monopoly of wisdom is something we need to address. We just need to own up. You know, some of us do not believe that William Ruto won the president. But the Supreme Court declared that he won. And we've made peace with that moving forward. This idea of trying to make Kenyans remember, like the president and the DP won, that now it's a government only of shareholders who have the monopoly of ideas, it's what's killing us. People must accept that there comes a time in certain matters when people must pull back. And blaming people historically does not help. Blaming people, as they keep saying, the problem arose during the handshake is of no consequence. The president now was the deputy president during the handshake. Some of us were outside. We were shouting about borrowing and the euro bond, and they defended it. So it does not help anyone. It is just to own up that Thank you on the wrong track. Right, uh, 8 o'clock on the nose, uh, Honorable Yusuf Hassan will also just uh, come back with you. Uh, get reactions, especially you being member of uh, the uh, departmental committee on foreign relations and intelligence and security and that reaction that uh, we had the U.S. Uh, Department of Justice uh, supporting uh, President William Ruto's appeal to the decision that had been made by the courts. What will be also uh, your reaction to that, especially when he says that uh, it is in the spirit of revitalizing and restoring democracy? And the question also of who is the majority in the National Assembly? Because I think this is a matter also that is still in court, Jabura, uh, if I'm, I'm, I'm right, uh, so that we know we, when will it be finalized? Because there has been that debate. Is it uh, the Kenya Kwanzaa or the Azimio side who actually holds or sway the numbers as far as the, the constitution of the National Assembly is concerned? So when we circle back, of course, we shall be looking at some of those issues uh, deeply. Uh, moving forward, don't go away. You're watching Siasa Fiesta here on Morning Prime.